What? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so what do I have to say? Oh, yeah, okay, yes. Um, yes, all right. I'm, <laughs> I don't have my name on there. Yes, I have a Peter's name on there. I don't have my name on there. My, I'm Jenny Cook Gumperts. I am a just retired professor from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Spent many, many, many years in Berkeley where I did research, some teaching, um, and, you know, so on. And I will now get going. Okay, I'm going to skip that one and go to the Habermasian one. Okay, so what I w had, what I intended with this was to say that the notion of public sphere is really, to my mind, based on the Habermasian notion of a reasoned, rational argumentation, a discourse which presents ideas calmly in a reasoned way. Um, it was, of course, in the Habermasian sense, as it says up there, dependent on but you can see older technology, print media, the establishment of a, pro of a professional middle class, social cliques, ways of um, sharing opinions. And one of the criticisms really made about it, many criticisms are made, but rarely is it strongly pointed out, of course, the whole thing rested upon the notion of a gendered world, men's opinions in a male world. And both in this way and in other ways, this was both a simplified narrative, a historically nostalgic and somewhat inaccurate. I'm going on a very good book that I recommend to absolutely everyone. It's dreadfully hard to get. You can download it from the internet. It's called Languages and Publics. And that is the core of the of Gall and Woolard's argument against the Habermasian model, which continues, you know, in in political discourse around the world. Um, that you to be a real politician, you should be able to stand up in front of an argument and make a decent, reasoned, coherent argument. Until recently, that was the gold standard. Um, and um, they point out, that Gall and Woolard, uh, Sue Gall and Kit Willard point out, um, that public sphere discourse ignores the actual languages. And we said this is, you know, you raise the point even about internet, um, fake news and real political news. Um, the actual language is used for discussion and debate. And these were in the, in the presumed standard. And this was very significant in terms of the rise of a political culture which was more open and more general in colonial situations. Um, so the rise of national languages, 19th, 20th century, colonial languages and social construction of presumed standard languages um, affected you know, this uh, discourse. Um, the specific language choices made by those governing for those governed. P public discourse assumes specific linguistic and sociolinguistic choices that are made. And I ask the question, how? Language descriptions based on gendered, biased, inequitable choices as languages of men in public places. The 20th century rise of a culture industry in mass media, and we seem to be in view of the talk we just had for quite a while. Um, you know, we seem to, are we, I mean, we can really ask, are we moving out of the, the criticism? Are we moving beyond the criticisms that were made um, in Germany and in, you know, by the Frankfurt School and in other, and in America and Britain about the culture industry and its relation to mass media? Um, you know, the tremendous worry over the dominance of one actor, uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch and all his great um, empire, Sky News, Fox News. I mean, in the United States at the moment, it is said that we are not governed by anybody but Fox News. And there's a couple of commentators on Fox News that determine what is to be discussed in the political domain. And one wonders, you know, is this what we mean by public sphere discourse? Anyway, the, trend, the rise of this thing, increasingly <coughs> the expansion of public discourse was concerned with presenting 
an educated view, a voice of public discourse. This was no longer the public sphere, but the idea of mass communication, the, you know, the coming of radio was to, and national radio programs, was to expand. I mean, there was the most amazing chapter written by Reese responsibilities in terms of, you know, are you hearing this? Okay, and in terms of um, the uh, public, this, this was now the voice of the public, um, but it didn't work that way. Uh, and in fact, it always depended upon, as you all know in India, that standard English of the BBC World Service, the BBC English. It was an amazing standardized creation that did not represent quite anyone's language. It was, as Sue Gal would say, a language, and as Kit Bullard would say, it was a language from nowhere. It was BBC English, and it had some very special interactional rules. Anybody who's given a talk on the BBC will know that. It's really quite fascinating. Um, about when you can breathe full sentences. It demanded, for instance, that speeches were given. Any talk, even the most casual interaction, had to be in a full sentence. That statement meant how important that was. How at that time, no one actually raised that question. Central to the argument, um, the identification of gender-specific, you know, and then her analyses, which one can always agree with, um, was the identification of a gender-specific lexical choices to what makes a woman a woman in terms of their ways of speech. They make certain specific lexical, and these got picked on and then turned into an ideal type, which gave, um, made the work then less politically powerful than it should have been. Uh, different lexical semantic choices and the whole industry that grew up on the pragmatics of politeness, which I know almost everyone in this room would know about. The politeness routines that the K-pop albums were stifling, exclusive, and oppressive of women. So the issues that were studied are, are the pragmatic features used in talk about women the same <coughs> as the ones that are used by women in their own discourses to each other? How do women talk when they're private? when they're not in the public domain. What is different about the way they do it? Are women the willing agents of their own? You see, that was the danger of the thing. Are willing women actually the willing agents of their own public rejections and powerlessness? Or will linguistic, sociolinguistic knowledge bring about a change? And that's true of almost everyone. In the case of Robin Lakoff's comments in the 1977 paper, the judgments of the ex of acceptability, using the linguist concept of acceptability, to look at women's talk in terms of their position within an existing ideology of gender. As Lakoff asks, when does a judgment of acceptability, is what you say, acceptable in the in the grammatical sense, in the linguist sense, in the sociolinguistic sense, cease to be a linguistic argument and become a political <coughs> statement. Now that uh, paper and others like the book Bobbins be republished in the book called Context Counts, edited by Laurel Sutton, published by uh, Oxford, so I should be very familiar. Okay. In the current context, we can see that language of women's place was a political document in that through linguistic pragmatic description, it presented the ideal typical woman uh, in the, and I've got one in quotes there, which you know, I should probably show you. In other words, the 1970s woman from the US. This resembles, in a way, Sue Gal's notion of the voice from nowhere. Um, the presentation of women as everyone believes them to be. In other words, an ideal type uh, within an ideology of gender. Descriptions of the public woman. I hadn't realized how much Robin wasn't talking about a working class woman trying to get kids off to school 
pushing the kids around the supermarket at, at six o'clock in the evening when everyone was hungry. Um, she was talking about an ideal woman, a woman as a political being, a public being. And criticisms of the original work focused on social class and ethnic exclusions. It seemed very much a, a, a portrait of the American white middle class woman of the 1970s. With social class and ethnic exclusions and needed to, ex to explore uh, and it needed to explore variants. The stereotype was not the norm, nor was it universal. Um, the question of politeness, which is the core of the Lakoff argument, um, is interesting because it works two ways. Politeness makes, for, uh, as uh, Brown Levinson pointed out in exquisite detail, makes for social bonding and the recognition of the complexity of social relationships. And, uh, and Robin Glenn made women not only appear deferential, but also positively as agents of social cohesion. But this raised the question, are women more dependent on small groups for their social, emotional reinforcement and support? Or is it that encouraging social bonding is essential to mothering? In other words, it still reinforces the idea of woman as the agent of motherhood, as the, you know, the second character that carries on the, uh, carries on the, um, the tribe of people that she's associated with. Um, but politeness can also be seen, uh, as focus on politeness shows the essential recursivity of the activity of speaking. The need to study. Yes, if you look detailed, as Brown Jones did, at the notion of um, politeness and all its ramifications, it shows you the need to um, study talk and interaction. Interaction is shot through this culture. It can better be because, oh yes, this is from Levinson's 1906 book, The Rules of Human Sociality. As Levinson pointed out there, the focus on politeness shows the essential reconsidity of the activity of speaking, the need to study talk in interaction. So I'm going to go on with this talk and say, OK, if we want to get closer to what we really mean um, by the shift in consciousness uh, uh, within public discourse about women, we need to look in detail at the many spheres and many areas, the many landscapes, the many choose your boy, choose your site as you will. Wherever women are, we need to look at them in detail because we need to look at their at specific talk in specific sites in specific places in interaction. And this interaction is shot through and through with culture. This is a quote and it's in the the intro to the roots of human sociality it was nice. It had better be because it, uh, it is the vehicle of culture. Okay, interaction is the vehicle of culture. Not just talk, but talk and interaction. Interacting and talk is the um, vehicle of culture. Without it, there would not be any. Even through cult, even though culture shapes our most private, that uh, even. Uh, culture shapes our most private acts, the way we urinate, etc., etc. Even the way we walk, it is through the public, especially interactive acts, that culture propagates itself. So, what I wanted to argue does it flicker up there? Yes, yeah, it does. Okay. The culture no. ideology. So, what I have to no. argue no. now is that That's in order right. to look at um, how we would situate talk and interaction. Yeah. So I'm going to go on to look at the argument is the culture ideology of gender, it, how it is created and how it informs how we interpret and contextualize women's discourse. So we have to contextualize and interpret uh, women's discourse. We have to look at the pragmatics of women's discourse within the cultural ideologies of gender. And for this little bit, um, 
I was referring to a paper in the recent handbook of, uh, what was it, Women and Language, uh, Janet Holmes and Miriam Meyer, Meyerhoff, Meyer, it's in my references, Meyerhoff, um, where Sue Phillips, Susan Phillips, who's done lots of work in schools, in, in, in reservations in America, and also field work in Tonga, um, where she, based on reflections on her own field work, which is what anthropologists do these days, reflections on field work, um, she says that cultural ideological differences revolve around essential, and I found this I don't know why it's so basic, and I found it so interesting, around basic relationship dyads. So, and it's against, I saw this culture of gender as the platform against which we're reading back these instances of talk. Um, and it made me reflect on, you know, the, women, the women's talk volume that I'm was so fond of because lot, most of the talk that women have with each other revolves around personal experiences but then back to the family or back to the children, back to a relationship with particular children or particular person. These dyadic patterns um, have great uh, cultural diversity around the world but they are exist in every so society and these dyadic patterns um, have great societal diversity of cultural ideology. And, you know, to know how even the smallest comment, um, the smallest uh, statements about women's language in the public domain, you need to know something about the cultural context in which these patterns are, and in, uh, which, against which you read back th these statements. Um, Sue Phillips commented that gender ideologies are not singular or stable, but they, ha they do over time change. They're polyphonic and changing and need to be understood within the context of local cultures and changes over historical time. So the relationship between women to men is greatly changing in the Western world. It varies according to, um, I mean, many other local cultural variations, but we have to trace these differences in the symbolic representation of gender relationships, demographic shifts that may alter these patterns and changes over historical times, discourse on performances and ritual, and we can then look back at political speeches as performance rituals, which of course in everyone's mind in the United States takes us back to why why was an intelligent, well-educated, thoughtful woman so hated in large chunks of America? Although she won the popular vote by 3.1 million, why was, did so much of America hate her? What is it about a woman that makes people... Um, uh, and what is the gender ideology of different parts of the United States? And if you're looking at how you're going to create, you know, um, your, what do you call it, your, your online videos or your online pieces of discourse, how you're going to shape those, you certainly need, unfortunately, to do a great deal of social research uh, anthropological research <coughs> on what it is how a woman is seen. And I, maybe they did do the background research. I don't think they did. I think it was happen chance. I don't think they did the background research. They wouldn't have put the money in. It costs hard money. Um, so I wanted now to shift, and I'm in heaps of time, and it's got rather muddled. I wanted to shift to look at gendered speech practices. Um, I wanted to look at some of the data that I've collected over the years, my own and others, which hopefully are making the point that I wanted to make about the fact that women, girls, um, 
do not look like the ideal public woman that was once discussed in language and women's place. They look very different. Now I leave it up to you whether it's a change in the cultural ideology about women. I mean, I think some of the stuff from that survey would suggest it isn't, but that there were always more um, differences than we thought. Oh yes, I do have it there. Okay, so what I did is I took three time slices through my data um, and the data that I'd collected, some's mine as I say and some belongs to other people. Most of my da data um, is, and I've got the papers in the um, references, I've worked with um, children's language socialization. So these are little ones from the age of three up through, um, well mine are usually three through five, they're really tiny. They're just beginning to learn what it's like to be a social being. Um, and um, one of the things I've been very concerned with my early work was the fact that going from the intimacy of the family to nursery school was a shift for a child from a private to a public domain. They were going into a world, even their peers are strangers, most of them. They don't know them, so they have to position themselves within a public world. Um, and I've always been particularly interested in what girls do in private, but within that public domain they make of the nursery school, they make little private spaces for themselves, the windy house, their little play things, sitting on a, a little um, mat, building things. I've got lots and lots of talk examples, um, and examples of little girls, as I say here. The whole thing is based on the idea of oppositional ways of talking. You oppose the, um, the, this is little girls privately, in private, opposing the good girl image. And yet knowing, as young as three or four, that that is the expected norm from their culture. Using, and they sometimes, I, examples, I haven't put them in, using examples of politeness as subversive control. I mean, two little girls, three little girls playing and the, the lead player, there's a little boy nearby and he's making a noise because he clearly wants to be in their group. And one girl sa says to her, to her others, uh, she says, um, she turns to the boy and says, will you please not make more noise? Will you please not make more noise? Um, so she says it politely but she has no intention of doing exactly what he's there because he keeps eyeing them and banging. He wants to get into their group. Children know when someone is an outside, excluded from a group and wants to get in, but they're not going to let him in because they've got a good play thing going and they're a good play scenario. They're not letting him in. So this is using politeness subversively. Um, I've also got other examples of using scenarios that oppose the nurturing image, refusing, um, one of my absolute favorites is res refusing to accept the burdens of motherhood. I had a paper called um, Reproducing the Discourse of, you'll see the, the titles in there, Reproducing the Discourse of Mothering, um, uh, being uh, women before, why girls have to be women before they can be big girls. So to these, to many girls, their first image of womanness is their own mother. Mothers, by being little girls, they have made their mother, their, this woman, into a mother. And they are afraid that they in their turn will have to have babies in order to be grown-up women. So they often oppose this notion, um, and you see the examples from the papers. Um, uh, they are as they play mothers with babies, but the babies are always naughty. They're, the babies get scolded. The babies have no voice. 
And there are other examples I have where two little girls are playing with babies near the Wendy house and are dipping them in the water and taking them out again and chuckling. And a grown-up comes by and she says, are you playing? Are you playing with the babies? And they say, yes, yes. And then they go back and you can hear on the tape they say, boil them. We're going to boil them until their skins fall off. You know, so they want to react to this notion that what mothers do is they cherish, they're nurturing, they're good girls. But, um, and I called the other paper, you know, I, uh, oppositional stances. So the different ways and the private life of little girls. So the private women, I think it's in the next one. Oh yes, boiling babies. Here's boiling babies. Um, and I'll flip through this, I don't want to be late. Um, and then, um, so there's an underlife. I mean, in Goffmanian terms, there's an underlife to the child, to the nursery school. If you really do, as I've done, hours, days, weeks, months, years of field work in um, in preschool, there was a preschool in Burke. I spent a lot of time there. Uh, which was where I did a lot of this work. And, and, but the boiling, uh, boiling babies comes, uh, I was doing some observations with a friend of mine in Britain. The, that one comes from the boiling babies, comes from the UK. Um, and you, know, the, you can see this underlife where little girls, um, oh yes, uh, are rejecting what they see as the necessary life of women. And then I also, uh, then looked at work um, in te with teenagers um, and and with grown women. So this is um, um, Jen Coates in an early paper, which she called "Women Behaving Badly," argued that women need a close peer group situation to let their not nice selves show in their talk. And she talked about you know in Goffmanian terms, backstage, front stage. Um, and, you know, women will use um, bad, uh, use swear words, which most women never use in public. Um, words related to all the private acts that a happen at home, um, from copulation to going to the bathroom. They will use fucking shit and all those words in private. And they will say nasty things about people but they say it when they feel very sure of their audience, very sure of being in a friendly environment. Of course, someone here was telling me a wonderful idea she had for field work. She was going to look at comedy clubs and comedy, and I think it's exactly with the women's comedians. You see all those, this oppressive politeness, the rules, of the public correct woman broken, and um, you know they have been very very powerful to the younger generation of women. Um, so I'm saying all the time we need to look at details of field work and studies of women's field work, and I have other examples. Um, uh, there's a very good book by. Um, we call her Candy. I'm sure you all know she's called Candy Goodwin, not Marjorie Harkness Goodwin. Um, uh, the Hidden Life of Girls, where she uh, does field work in um, Los Angeles with it's it's years of field work with um, small uh, with girls. Um, and then I also had this rather nice one I like from. So these are. Let me see. Oh yeah, and I had the Mean Girls thing. So there's a whole genre of things which look at girls being mean and negative, not caring and supportive. So oppositional to the no notion of care and supportive friend friendship, which is the, you know, the ideal uh, or the ideal type of what a woman is and what a girl is. Yeah, I like the, immig the immigrant one. Her mother's, a, she's an immigrant girl from, um, well, from Russia, from that Russian edge, which, uh, you know, S Cyprus had a lot of Auslander Cypriots who were Greek-speaking, Auslander Greeks, who were 
um, Greek speaking, but had lived in the Soviet and Soviet Russia. So as soon as Soviet Russia went, they looked for Greek communities to come to, and a lot of them came to Cyprus, which has a great big tourist industry. Um, and her Cypriot partner in some school activity, they had to clean up their work tables. And so the, the immigrant girls started cleaning it up, and the Cypriot girls said this, sweep it, sweep it, I'll give you five cents. You know, being really nasty and mean. Um, okay, so there's a nice example here of from Candy Goodwin's Hidden Life of Girls, which you may or may not w be able to see, but it, uh, it, as with all of Candy's work, it's extremely detailed analysis of the conversation. But I was focusing on that little bit in the middle, where the girls, this constant refrain in this talk, the girls are complaining, you know, that girls, that the pants, that one of their friends who isn't there that day is, has, sh they can't stand her clothes, you see? The, I hate those pants, they're ugly, he says. Um, and this is, you know, there's, um, the other thing is, so we've got the mean girls talk, we've got coarse talk, uh, young women's talk as rebellion against the stereotype of the quiet, proper girl in public settings. Um, there's a very nice book by Benuko Inoue of, um, um, it's called Vicarious Talk. It's really interesting, and it, as a, it's an, a linguistic anthropology of, um, of women's talk in uh, Japan. It was published, what, about it, um, 10 years ago. So it would have been current talk. But she had a big piece on the um, histor historical descriptions of women's language. Now, of course, as you all know, um, in Japanese, you know, there are so many complicated ways in language of marking status and gender and politeness and who can talk to whom. Um, and the idea, and I didn't know this, that if you use what they call, um, you don't use traditional politeness forms in girl t even in girl, to go girl talk, it's called shop girl talk because these were the first jobs that women were allowed to have in late 19th century Japan. So they called it shop girl talk. Um, and I have an example on the next page of power girls. So see, what I'm using, I'm using these linguistic uh, examples, um, these linguistic anthropological examples, as sort of vignettes to illustrate the point that always in a more private domain, women were not the quiet, subversive, uh, submissive, proper girls that we think they are. Um, Mendoza Denton's work on uh, Latina gang girls. I'm pointing this out to you because if you want to have a look at these readings, you know, many people sent readings ahead. I didn't. Um, actually, no, I had to. Um, and the gang girls describe it as talking shit when they talk, coarse talk. Um, and Janet Holmes has worked on uh, women in workplaces, in working class workplaces. She studied in factories, factory sites, packing, packing room in a factory, um, and looked at how women, even with men, in, in the, so the, the site and the context, we talked about context for doing any research on pragmatics, so the context is all important, so within the, factory, uh, it was perfectly all right for them to use male terms, cuss words, various things, again, which were quite counter the, to their outside public image, so the public primate distinction. Um, and then I think in the next slide, I've got some slides of a really interesting study by Inken Keim, which is not available in English, it's only available in German, unfortunately, as a whole book. But there is in a, um, an edited volume by Peter Auer on um, social 
identity and so and style there is an article by Inken and I think I took the examples from there this concept that she found of power girls that Tur third generation Turkish German teenagers at school um, saw themselves as forging a new style they saw themselves as gaining independence as women after all they are from very traditional Turkish-speaking homes where girls were not allowed to go out on their own, where they wore headscarves. Um, these girls don't, and they go to coffee places and talk. They're the new power girls they've had um, in school. They've forged a new identity for themselves, and part of this uses Turkish-German code splitting, using expletives and impolite Turkish forms to show, you know, we're not afraid, we're the power girls. It's, and they actually do graffiti. They, I, I think in somewhere, if only I could find it in my photos, I took photos of their, uh, of this power girls um, uh, uh, graffiti on one side of a, um, a parking lot. This is the power girls, which I don't think you'll see, but if anyone's interested, you know, uh, it's much too small. I can't read it on this screen. Um, and more. It's very detailed, um, wonderfully detailed linguistics, uh, so linguistic pragmatic work. Incan did years of field work with the young women in Mannheim. These were all Turkish women in who's, who were the product of, I think there was third generation. Their grandparents will have come from Turkey, as, as what Jeff talked about. As, was it you, Jeff? Yes, te guest workers. They came as guest workers. They stayed as migrants, <laughs> which is the new German term for it. Um, and now these girls know not Turkey, but they are German. But they, since they le grow up speaking Turkish at home, they make use of it in public settings to such as school to strike a new identity for themselves. And then in this one, the speaker is arguing that we shouldn't do this because it's, um, she said it's shameful. She, she uses a few really rude um, uh, Turkish expressions and then she finishes the argument with a self-reflexive con comment. We disgraced ourselves completely. We shouldn't do this. Um, so, that my last little bit, oh good, I've lots of time. Last little bit, then we can finish. We have a couple of questions and we can do it all today. Um, Taking back agency through learning to do speech making. So I ask myself, if women can be oppositional, challenge authority in private, and if in public the most private things about their persona are talked about, how can women learn to take back agency? Now, I started this idea before the Me Too movement. Now, people claim the Me Too movement is doing it, but I don't quite see how. But I do see how in the work that I quickly am going to talk about, very quickly. Um, and it might be very old-fashioned, but the idea of learning to do speech-making, advocacy, and reason debate actually go back to public sphere discourse you know take back the 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 high ground take back being um an advocate for yourself in a sense the power girls were doing that um so it just so happened i've had two students wonderful students women um one who unfortunately never finished for many personal reasons, did some wonderful work in the UN looking at advocacy training, focusing on women. She took, she went with a small group of women from, uh, and they were American women, and they, in the, this program operated by the UN for um, training women in being more involved in the public sphere, they, um, 
uh, teamed up with women from other countries. Um, and they had a, a, a week being, you know, wearing a little badge and going around the United Nations and doing things and having lectures on, because the idea was they were being trained to be advocates for their own position from their own societies in this globalized body, but do it uh, in, a gr in a reasoned way. Enter the public sphere discourse. Leave that messy, huge, private, um, you know, expanded public sphere and go into the public sphere and talk about their own positions. Uh, it troubled my student greatly that the thing that was being focused on in the advocacy training was that um, there had been a meeting of UN um, advisors or representatives and people from all countries of the world and they had focused on women as mothers. There was something about the uh, women, there's something called the Beijing, I'm sure Rukman, he knows about this. There's something called the Beijing platform, you know all about that. Yes, it's very important. Now, Sarah's group was taken and they talked about this. And when she came back, she decided that the paper that she would write, that she never finished, tragedy, was going to be called The Politics of Motherhood and how um, women had to learn to make an argument for themselves, both as mothers and as not mothers, for how women were positioned in contemporary society. So, um, and then the other example for which there is a paper, and I'll show a bit of data, and I've got it in my references, um, this was about, so there was advocacy training on the politics of motherhood as an international globalized concern with what it is that women do. And then the other thing, this was um, very Californian and it was about teenagers learning to debate, to do reasoned uh, public sphere discourse in two languages because the program that my student studied, and boy, was that field work. She was with it for about a year, was a program, and she believes in it. I mean, she's passionate about it, uh, because her husband was the product of such a family. It's uh, a little quirk in the American Education Federal Acts on Education. is something called the Migrant Education Act, and that requires... Um, the children who come with migrant parents on work visas, limited time work visas to work the fields of California, upstate New York and Florida, and oh, and pick apples in Washington state, and in California pick um, lettuces, broccoli, strawberries. They live in migrant worker camps, but the children couldn't go to school. So the Migrant Education Act required schools to put on special programs to take these children, whatever their age is, wherever they came from, the, they come out of the, the colonias, they're called, these migrant worker camps. They come to the nearby school and they're entered into the school, even though they're only going to be there for a year or half a year, however many crops the parents have been hired to pick. Um, and what was uh, in, in a, the nearby town to Santa Barbara, there was um, concern that this meant, yes, they got regular basic schooling, but these teenagers didn't get any of the things that their regular kids in the school got. They didn't get sports, they didn't get after school clubs for drama, um, all kinds of things, because the, the, the view was, oh, they're not going to be there long enough. You know, they can't really do those things. And um, one particularly remarkable old man decided this was completely unfair. And one thing these children should learn to do, and then we go back to the beginning, to the Habermasian, they should learn to debate. It's called forensics in American education. It's debate clubs, madly popular. 
madly popular. Every, you know, kids love it. Um, so the um, these migrant children, uh, teenagers, they set up their own debate program in a number of schools and the number of schools throughout the Valley of California, from from inland from Sacramento through Sacramento down on the other side of Los Angeles, always up that great bread basket, fruit basket of the United States, which is um, the Central Valley of California. Um, they had programs um, in schools for debate clubs for migrant children. And they could choose in the data I'm going to show you and the research that she did that became her PhD. She's now an associate professor at a university in Seattle called Seattle Pacific. Um, she's, uh, the, the work that she did um, the kids could choose to debate in English or to debate in Spanish. And it's very appropriate to the things we've been talking about at the beginning in terms of standard language because, of course, the English of school is a standardized English. It's a different English. The English of the Spanish is not the Mexican Spanish that they talk to their parents in. It's a school Spanish. We've argued this for a long time. It's a very different kind of Spanish. It's very correct. Um, so, um, oh yeah, and I, I have a few pictures. So one of the things, of course, in the debate club, um, and then I'll show you the data, because I guess the pictures come up. This is one of the young women. That, so they're being trained to be debaters. And to, they have a, a serious proposition. This is the, the coach. I don't know why the pictures come out so bad. They have to make notes. They have their, their note cards to talk from. Um, and what what Julie and I, her name is Julie and Tia Gazara, Gaza, Gaza, oh, Gazara, no, Ga, I can, I, there's a syllable too many I put in there. I just, um, the, what we were particularly interested in Julie and I was the the fact that the um, that the uh, they were debating because we called it debating the world. They were given a proposition just as you would be in a in a debate club in a university from Oxford and Cambridge on downwards onwards. Um, they were given a serious proposition. The one that we had the examples for, they were asked to debate for and against the proposition that um, if children commit, if seven, a 17-year-old commits a crime, which is um, in the statute book an adult crime, should they be tried as an adult? You know, if they mm, commit manslaughter or murder or something. And remember, this, this is a society where <laughs> shootings are a daily occurrence. Um, and uh, the paper that I've got uh, that you can see and read, and these are some of the examples um, where they, so they have to do research in the school library. They work with their debate coach. In this case, they select, cite a philosopher that I hadn't heard of, who as a Spanish philosopher, philosopher Bernabe, um, said it is misunderstood that society is anything when the individual is guilty. Therefore, why not rehabilitate the juvenile if it is easier, less costly, and more effective? And their opponent says, can you restate that? Sorry, the question or anything or everything? Just the question. Why not rehabilitate the juveniles if it's easier, less costly, and more effective? Um, and then the Spanish team says the same thing, does the same thing in Spanish. Um, the paper you see here is all about academic discourse. Julie and I wrote a very different paper. We were much more interested in the way in which debating was a uh, was um, a preparation for a world outside of school where they could go and become advocates for their own communities, their own, you know, their uh, their fellows and things that like that. The 
journal that was available, you know we're going to talk about publishing this afternoon, well there was a journal available, uh, Linguistics in Education, that wanted a paper from me. So, um, and Julie was coming to the end of her dissertation, so we immediately put something together and we thought it was great, we loved it. Unfortunately, the German um, editors wanted lots and lots of stuff on academic discourse, which is the great worry in Germany at the moment, that their migrant, as they say, their migrant populations may not learn academic English. So we had to recast the paper because she absolutely, she was the breadwinner for her family, her husband has a congenital illness. She absolutely had to get a job and so we absolutely had to get a couple of papers out. So we recast our argument, although we, oh yes, although we preferred it in a different format, but we recast it again in terms of the, you know, the importance of this as a preparation for academic debate. But we saw it, I'm going back through the pictures, because I want to make another point here, because I've got to the end. Um, I want to make a point about how the debate, also debating, is for American students um, an occasion when they have to stand up in public, they have to talk, but they also have to dress and carry themselves correctly. So these are kids who might have come to school, you know, in cut, what are called cut-off jeans, you know, cut-off shorts, and it's very hot in that central valley. Everybody's hot as it is, and dusty, as it is in Gujarat. Um, they had to have proper clothes. You see this young lady with tight pants and a jacket. Um, you can't see it very well, but she's in Julie's data. Oh, you can see it much better up there. Yeah, in Julie's data, there's some really nice shots. And, you know, she had lots of videotape. So learning to to perform within the debate becomes itself an excellent training for a world outside which has nothing to do with academic discourse but everything to do with living and um, learning how to be a public woman in the public sphere. I found it very telling. Okay. I think that's the end. So in the conclusion, I said, there's no formal conclusion. This is more a collection of ideas rather than a formal paper, which you've discovered. Um, and I think the suggestions for further research can be picked up for discussion. And I think, oh dear, I think my references aren't there. They're in another file marked references, which I'll find and put up there. Okay. Okay, so has anyone got any questions? Yes.